good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning. If you're in Canberra, Australia, uh, I'd like to welcome you to another QCAM webinar. It's number 30. Today is our privilege to have Professor Peter Gill uh, give a talk about uh, IQMOL for beginners. It's a really interesting topic, useful for a lot of a lot of you listening, I'm sure. I'd like to thank everyone for attending and invite you all to uh, post your questions in the little question box here in the GoToWebinar control panel, and I will go through them at the end and um, uh, present them to the speaker. So I'd like to introduce our speaker, and it's, it's hard to sum up uh, a career as illustrious as, as Peter's in, in a brief couple sentences, but I'll do my best. Uh, Peter Gill obtained his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Auckland, and he got his PhD at the Australian National University, where he worked with Leo Radom. He then did a postdoc with the, the father of quantum chemistry, John Popel, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, since then, he's, he's led an extremely productive career. He's had research groups at Mass University, University of Cambridge, and the University of Nottingham. Currently, he's a professor at the Australian National University in Canberra, where the focus of his research is on correlated methods, excited states, and density functional theory. And I have to say, if you've ever seen Peter give a talk, it's, it's always really fascinating how he uh, takes an established topic and presents it from an entirely new perspective. Uh, Peter has earned a, a laudable array of achievements, including the Dirac Medal, the Schrodinger Medal, and, and many others. Among his many achievements, he was one of the founders of QCAM in 1993, and he's currently our president of the board of directors. All right, without uh, any further ado, I'd like to turn over to our speaker. Good afternoon, everybody, um, or good morning if you happen to be in Canberra like me. Um, and welcome to this uh, webinar on IQMOL for beginners. This is uh, designed to be um, uh, very much an introduction for people who perhaps haven't used IQMOL before or perhaps haven't even used any quantum chemistry package before. And I hope that it will uh, provide an easy entry point uh, for those of you who fall into that category. Let me begin, though, um, by just removing a uh, potential source of confusion, and that's the relationship between QCHEM and IQMOL. So QCHEM is a very big commercial software package, um, millions of lines of code, and it's what we call the back end. So it's the, um, the number crunching uh, operator in all of this. It actually finds the approximate solutions to the Schrodinger equation for molecules, uh, which is of interest to chemists and others, um, but it's not a particularly easy beast to use by itself. And for that reason, a few years ago, uh, Dr. Andrew Gilbert uh, decided to create a front end um, to go alongside uh, QCAM, and that front end is called IQMOL. And unlike QCAM, IQMOL is open source package, so you can download uh, both the source and the executable of IQMOL. Uh, you can see there the, the website, iqmol.org. And uh, Andrew continues to be the main curator of this uh, package. And what this does, if you have IQMOL, is it allows you to communicate easily with QCHEM in the background. And I'll emphasize a little bit later just how far in the background QCHEM can actually be. But for most of us, we want QCHEM to be a long way in the background. We're happy for it to take care of its number crunching independently and distantly from us while we interact with IQMOL, the front end. So this webinar is gonna focus on that front end, IQMOL. So uh, we're gonna take a look at it, and in order that you be able to do what I'm going to do, you really only need to do four steps. Uh, you need to go to iqmol.org, uh, the website that I just showed you, click on the download link, which is in the navigation bar on the left. That will download IQMOL onto your computer. Um, either the Windows or the Mac or the Linux version. And then you install that on your computer. And for most people, that installation process is completely uh, trivial. Just a double click and you're away. And then you open up the app. And when you open it up, you have a big blue screen and some buttons. 
and that's the blue screen in which I'm going to be operating um, for now, from now on. So I'm going to close down uh, that little presentation that I was just showing you and open up instead IQMOL by just clicking it in my dock. And uh, you can see this large window emerges. I can move it around like uh, any sort of window. I'm just going to make it nice and big. So I've got plenty of room, real estate in which to mess around. Uh, I thought I would start off with a specific example. Suppose I want to make uh, the molecule cis difluoroethene. So this is a small organicish sort of molecule. Uh, how would I go about doing that? Well, <clears throat> in this large blue area is where I'm going to draw the molecule uh, to begin with. And later on, it's where I'm going to be able to see the results of the calculations. Uh, but how do I draw a molecule? Well, if you go up to the top here, you'll see an array of buttons. And uh, the leftmost one uh, is a blank sheet of paper. By default, that's the one we've already started on. That's the new molecule button. That means I'm starting some new project. And then a few buttons along, you see a C uh, inside a box, and that is the default um, atom, which is carbon, which will please the organic chemists in the audience and displease the inorganic ones. But it's very easy to change because I just have to click on it and it opens up a periodic table and then I can then select from any atom up to Lorentzium anyway. Uh, for the moment, uh, carbon is fine because I want to make cis difluoroethene. So I simply click in the middle of the blue window and that creates a carbon atom or perhaps I should say a carbon nucleus, uh, which is just sitting there at the moment, not connected to anything else. I'd like to connect that to another atom, uh, another carbon atom, in fact. So I'm going to click. So I click on that, drag to the right, and release. And that has created a new carbon atom, this one connected by a single bond to the first carbon atom, which is easy. Uh, but it's not exactly what we want, because we want a carbon-carbon double bond, since we're making a substituted ethene. How do I make a double bond? I click again and drag backwards uh, on top of the first one and release. And by overwriting the bond, as it were, I create a second bond. So I've now created a double bond. So IQMOL now knows that it has two carbon atoms connected by a double bond. Now, at this point, I could go up to the periodic table and click on this and select hydrogen and then draw some hydrogens in the way that I just drew some carbons. Um, but I won't do that because there's a lazier option, which is usually very helpful, which is this one here, just two to the right of the atom button, which is the add hydrogens button. So if I click on that, IQMOL automatically adds hydrogens to all of the atoms whose conventional valency is not satisfied. So it saw that each carbon uh, had a valence of two, and so it added two hydrogens to each carbon atom. And this looks like a pretty nice molecule. Maybe it's not oriented quite as I would like. So I can go up to the hand icon in the top left-hand corner here. If I click on that, I'm no longer in build mode now. I'm now in manipulate mode. And you see that the icon of my cursor has changed. It's now a hand. And if I click and drag now, I can move the molecule. So I can rotate it into, there's a nice planar version of the molecule, or I can spin it around like this, so I can do whatever I like with it, drag it in all kinds of funny directions, um, and then release, and uh, then it will sit in that position. So that's an ethene molecule, which is a good start on the way to a dichloro, sorry, a difluoroethene, but it's still not quite right because I don't have any fluorine atoms. So how do I change this molecule into the one that I want? Well, I'm going to go up to the periodic table. I'm going to do some alchemy so I'm going to select fluorine, and then I come back, and I simply click on one of the hydrogens, and it becomes a fluorine. So that is something that in the Middle Ages they would have loved to be able to do, and we can do it now in the 21st century, just at the click of a button. I want cis difluoroethene, so I also need to click on this guy. And now I have a rather crudely drawn cis difluoroethene. Uh, it's crude, crudely drawn because I'm not a very good artist, and fortunately, because of IQMOL's abilities, I don't need to be a very good artist. 
because I can come up now to yet another button. You see here a button with an E and a downward arrow. And uh, the, the hint that appears when I rest on it is minimize energy. If I click on this button, it's going to invoke a force field calculation, very quick, very cheap, uh, slightly dirty calculation to get a, an improved uh, structure for this cis difluoroethene that I've drawn. So if I click on that, you'll see that in a nice animation, the carbon-carbon bond became shorter because I had drawn it too long. The carbon fluorine bonds became longer because I had drawn those too short. In fact, they inherited the carbon hydrogen bond lengths. And now I have quite a respectable looking cis uh, difluoroethene molecule. Um, I can uh, manipulate this as before. If I go into manipulate mode, I can turn it around. I can do whatever I like to it. Uh, but sometimes after you've been drawing for a while, your molecule's not sitting exactly where you'd like to be on the screen. So it can be useful to, uh, if you look up in the build menu here, you can see there's an option to translate to the center. There's a shortcut for that, which is command T on my Mac. So I'll just do command T and the molecule is just drifts towards the center so that its center of mass is in the middle of the screen. I can also, under the build menu, symmetrize the molecule. Um, so we probably remember from our spectroscopy course, if we did one, uh, that this molecule has um, a certain point group symmetry. And if I click on symmetrize molecule, what IQMOL will do is it will look at the structure that I have drawn and it will, with some fuzzy logic, it will say, well, this looks pretty close to a certain point group symmetry and it will then polish the structure so that it is perfectly of that point group symmetry. So I'm going to click on symmetrize molecule and it spun round a bit and it now has uh, the correct C2V symmetry. And if you had sharp eyes, you might have seen that appear down here in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, when I clicked on symmetrize molecule, it um, printed for a few seconds um, point group C2V. So we now have a nicely symmetric difluoroethene molecule. And uh, what else can we do? Well, I'm going to manipulate it into uh, a nice shape where I can see things more clearly. Uh, there are a variety of single keyboard uh, buttons that will make various things happen. For example, if I press A, um, it imposes um, axes on the system. So these are X, Y, Z Cartesian axes, which are now connected to the molecule. And you can see those moving around. And so I can use those, in fact, to make sure that my molecule is very precisely aligned in um, the X, Z plane. And if I press A again, the axes disappear. Um, you can find what these shortcuts are by going to display and um, the atom labels. Uh, you can see a variety of shortcut keys here, um, E, I, M, N, Q, and S. You can play with these. So if I press E, for example, E just uh, shows me, in case I've forgotten, uh, what the elements are in these various positions. So hydrogens marked with H, carbons with C, and fluorines with F. Uh, you can change the, the size of the font. I've got it on the size that I like for this purpose, but if I go to the IQMOL preferences, you can see the label font size is currently set to 36 points. I can change that uh, to anything else that I like, but I'll stick with what I have at the moment. Press E again to turn off the element symbols. Press M, um, and that superimposes the relative atomic masses um, on each of the nuclei just to make sure uh, what isotopes I'm dealing with. Um, and then if I turn those off by pressing M again and finally press Q, that gives me some atomic charges in this uh, cis difluoroethene. These charges are gas tiger charges, which are quick and dirty charges, which are used quite a lot in the molecular mechanics community. And they're determined by electronegativity equalization. They give us a rough idea that, uh, for example, fluorines are negative and uh, hydrogens are a bit positive in a molecule like this. All right, so I'll turn off those charges by pressing Q again. 
Um, we're now ready to do our, our first calculation. So everything I've done so far has been in IQMOL, but I'm now going to begin the process of talking to QChem in order to do a quantum chemical calculation. So the way I do that, having drawn my molecule, I then go up to the top here to calculation, click on that, and you see that the first item is QChem setup. That's what I want to do. I want to do a QChem setup. So I click on that. A large dialog box appears, and it looks a little bit fearsome when it first appears. There are a lot of buttons and knobs on it, but uh, we're just going to focus on the simplest and most important ones, which are up near the top of this box. Um, so you can see that we've got a setup dialog here. There's also an advanced one, which we won't touch today, um, but uh, you may see that in a few weeks. So by default, a QChem job uh, will calculate the energy of the molecule, uh, but you can see that's something that can be changed to a variety of other things. For the moment, we're going to leave it on energy. What method does QChem use? Well, by default, it uses HF, which stands for Hartree-Fock. Uh, but again, I can click on that, and there is a very large uh, box of options here for methods that uh, one could use including, of course, the ubiquitous B3-LIP, every organic chemist's favorite. So I'll leave it on Hartree-Fock for the moment. And the basis set, um, the grab bag of functions that I'll use to represent my orbitals is by default set to 631G, which is a rather small popal type basis set. Again, I can click on that and there's a large range of alternative basis sets from which I can choose. If I want to do a fancy calculation, I'm happy to leave it at 631G for the moment. Um, so in fact, I haven't changed anything. Uh, it's set up to do an energy calculation at the Hartree-Fock 631G level. And uh, I'm now ready to click on submit and uh, tell QChem to do that calculation. But just before I do that, I notice that above the submit button, there is a server um, pull down menu. And again, by default, that's set to a server, a server is a large computer called QChem. So this is in fact uh, a server in California, uh, which is available for public use. And uh, if I leave this set on QChem, then the QChem job that we will shortly run will be run on that computer in California. I have the option if I click on this also to run locally on my own machine. Um, that's because I have QChem on my machine. You may not have QChem on your machine. If you don't have a copy of QChem on your computer, then you will have to use the Californian server. That will be the only option available to you. So I'm going to leave that on here because as a patriotic Australian, I would prefer to burn American electrons than Australian ones. So I'm going to submit this job to the QChem server in California by submitting Clicking that button, it asks for a title for the job. I'm going to call it CIS C2 H2 F2. Seems like a meaningful name. And uh, click on OK. The dialog box then disappears and the task is now sent off through the internet to that computer in California. Uh, probably my Californian friends are noticing that the lighting is getting dim where they are because a computer is firing up to do these calculations. They won't take very long because so this is a relatively cheap calculation on a small molecule. And indeed, I've just got the message that job cis C2H2F2 is finished. Would I like to copy the results back from the server in California? Well, yes, I would, because if I don't, I won't be able to see the results of the calculation. So very rarely would one say no to this question. I'm going to say yes. I just notice here up in the left hand side, uh, it's keeping track here of the calculations we're doing and it's written CIS C2H2F2, that's the title I selected before. Uh, at the moment, we just have these gray characters beside. I'm gonna come down here, I'm gonna copy the results of the calculation back from California. It asks me where I'd like to put those results. I'm going to create a new folder on my desktop. I'm going to call it um, ethene. Let's create that folder and then I'm going to open that folder, copy the results back from California into that folder. And notice what's happened up on the left hand side here. We've now got a gold star 
beside uh, the name of the job, that's a good sign. When you have a gold star like that, it means that the calculation executed correctly, everything went according to plan and nothing bad happened. What's an example of the sort of things that uh, could go wrong with a calculation? Well, perhaps I set up the input incorrectly or perhaps um, uh, the calculation failed to converge maybe or some sort of um, QCAM oriented error like that. Or maybe, um, this is more likely in fact, I've exceeded the time limit. This uh, machine in California I said is free for public use, but there is a time limit of 10 minutes. So if your job takes longer than 10 minutes, it will abort after 10 minutes. And uh, you probably won't see a nice gold star when you copy the results back. All right, so I have copied the results back now. I'm ready now to interrogate uh, this molecule and see what QCAM calculated. And I can do that interrogation still through IQMOL, which is nice. So I never need to see QCAM at all. I can do everything with IQMOL. So let's begin by um, having a look, for example, at uh, some structural aspects of this molecule. If I go up to the button, which looks like a little uh, torch, flashlight, something like that. If I click on that, that puts me into select mode. So I click on that. Now, anything that I click in the molecule will be selected. So for example, I could click on this fluorine atom, uh, which didn't quite work for some reason. Sorry, just come back to manipulate that. Just try that again. Select that. That's still not working. Uh, not quite sure what's happened with that. Could be that I haven't opened this up yet. Uh, yes, that was the problem. Sorry about that. Uh, so needed to open that up. And now try again what I did before to go into select mode, select a fluorine atom, and it develops a, a red halo around it, which indicates that it's been selected. And if I go and select the carbon atom to which it's connected, it also gets a red halo. And down in the left-hand corner here of the blue screen, you can see it says distance 1.34507 angstroms. So that is the chlorine to carbon bond length in this molecule, uh, according to the calculations I've done so far. If I click uh, on the other carbon atom as well, so now I've selected three atoms in the order chlorine, uh, fluorine, carbon, carbon. IQMOL now recognizes that I'm asking for an angle, and you'll see down here. In the left-hand corner, it says an angle of 102.9, sorry, 121.9 degrees. And if I click on the other fluorine atom, I've now selected four atoms. IQMOL reckons that I've asked for a, a torsional angle, ask for the torsional angle between this fluorine, chlorine, fluorine, carbon, carbon, fluorine, torsion, uh, which is showing up as zero degrees, which is what one would expect because these two fluorine atoms are cis on the same side of the double bond. I can uh, now, having done that, uh, go back to, uh, to build and, um, sorry, uh, back to edit and select none, just to turn those selections off. And I can now show you something else on this molecule. Uh, if I go to info in the left-hand side here in the navigation bar, open that up, you'll see that dipole is one of the options I have. If I click on that, it creates a, a nice aqua arrow, which shows the dipole moment vector in this molecule, uh, pointing in the direction that a test positive charge uh, would be forced if it were placed in this molecule, which is nice to see. So we'll turn that off now, having identified this as a polar molecule. The next thing I'd like to do is uh, compute some orbitals. Uh, because we've done that calculation in QCAM, QCAM knows what the molecular orbitals are in this molecule. So I can now plot those using IQMOL. If I go to the navigation bar on the left-hand side here and select surfaces, um, then you see canonical orbitals is the option that I have. And if I double click, click, click on that, I have a dialog box which appears. I'm just going to slide that dialog box off to the side so it's not in the way. And by default, it's set up to uh, plot um, an orbital. Actually, it's the orbital for the alpha electrons. It's the spin-up electrons. 
same as the spin down in this molecule. And by default, it's set up to plot all the orbitals between the HOMO, the highest occupied, and the LUMO, the lowest unoccupied, though I can change those ranges if I wish. I'm going to leave those at the moment and just uh, ask for plots of the HOMO and LUMO in this molecule. I can change the ISO value if I wish. I can play with the quality of the orbital. At the moment, it's somewhere in the middle between low quality and high quality. The opacity, how opaque the orbital is, is also set to about 50%. So I'm going to calculate these. The calculations happened possibly too fast even for you to see them. And what we are now seeing is the HOMO, I believe. But if I go over to the left-hand side and open up canonical orbitals, uh, that confirms that, yes, the orbital I'm looking at here is number 16, the HOMO. That is the one that's selected. If I go into manipulate mode, I can rotate this and get a look at what this HOMO looks like. It's uh, a rather beautiful orbital, if you like orbitals. Um, and the LUMO, what does the LUMO look like? Well, if I click on LUMO, uh, something very bizarre just happened then. This is not the LUMO that I'm looking at. This is a trick for young players. Uh, when I clicked on LUMO, I neglected to unclick HOMO. So I'm simultaneously looking here at the HOMO and the LUMO. So I'm going to turn off the HOMO so that I can look just at the LUMO. So this is the LUMO of the molecule. Uh, which I can manipulate to my heart's content. I can then double click on this LUMO, double click over here, and I can then change features of that surface. For example, I can change its opacity. At the moment, it's roughly 50% opaque, which means that I can see the nuclear framework inside the LUMO. Can't see it very clearly, it's somewhat hidden by the orbital. If I play with the opacity, if I drag the opacity to the right, all the way to the right, I now have a fully opaque orbital. I now can't see the nuclear framework at all. If I go the other way and reduce the opacity in the extreme, I can't see the orbital anymore, and now I can see the nuclear framework perfectly. So now perhaps you can see why I like to have it around about 50% when I'm using this for teaching freshmen uh, that's a, a suitable setting so that they can see where the orbital lies relative to the nuclear framework. Once I've decided that the uh, orbital is oriented the way I like it and has the right opacity and anything else I like, I can then go to File and I could do a Save Picture. So uh, if I clicked on Save Picture, it would take a picture of this, um, which it saves with the name Snapshot. Uh, saves it by default as a JPEG, but that's uh, adjustable. I don't like that format. And then I can save this um, onto my desktop and perhaps use that uh, for a publication or something like that. Okay, um, that was the HOMO and LUMO orbitals. What other things can we plot in this molecule? Just start orient it, make it a bit flatter again. If I double click on canonical orbitals again, Another thing that we can plot, which is not an orbital, is the total electron density in the system. So if I click on that um, and calculate that, it takes slightly longer, uh, still rather quick though, and I get a surface there which shows the, the an ISO surface contour plot of the total electron density in cis difluoroethene. And as usual, I can manipulate this, I can turn it around, have a look at it. It's not a terribly interesting surface, um, just a little bit dull, I suppose, and nothing very surprising about it. But the nice thing about this is that if we double click on total density um, there, we can now plot something on that surface. For example, I can plot the electrostatic potential um, that this molecule creates as felt on that surface. I'm going to use the, um, the gas Steiger charges. And now that has um, superimposed that electrostatic potential onto that density isosurface. And you can see that the top of the molecule, the way I have it oriented here, uh, has a more negative potential and the bottom has a more positive potential, which is consistent with the, 
the fluorines being electronegative atoms that are pulling a lot of electron density towards themselves. All right, so I think we've done enough with our cis-difluoroethene for the moment. Um, let me close this down by turning that off and closing that up, close that up, and we'll create a, a new molecule now. Um, another of the nice features of IQMOL is that you can draw large structures very quickly uh, because there are a lot of built-in molecules and fragments which make uh, the creation of molecules uh, much faster than it would be if you had to draw every atom. Uh, the, the key box here, the key button, is this one just to the right of the atom, the element button, which is the add fragment button. Suppose, for example, I'd like to make a triphenylphosphine. That's a nice molecule if you're an inorganic chemist. So phenyl groups would take quite a while to draw, especially three of them. Um, so let me show you a very quick way of making triphenylphosphine. So I would go to my periodic table. I would select phosphorus come into the build menu, click, and phosphorus, according to IQMOL, is an orange atom. Then I go up to the add fragment button. I click on that, and I scroll down to the functional group that I would like. And the functional group I would like is a phenyl group. I click on phenyl. It shows me a picture of what phenyl looks like, just to make sure as a sanity check that that is what I want. Yes, please, I'd like to select that. Um, so now my little hammer here, um, rather than adding a single atom, is going to add a phenyl group. So if I click on the phosphorus and drag out from the phosphorus, you can see that I've now added an entire phenyl group to my phosphorus atom. And if I go back and repeat, click and drag, and then repeat again, click and drag, I've now made a rather crude triphenyl phosphine. If I uh, click on the down arrow, that's the minimize energy that has a force field calculation just to make it a more civilized structure. Go into manipulate mode. I can then turn this around and have a look at it. And uh, that does look rather the way that triphenylphosphine probably should look. Um, the phosphorus is pyramidalized and the uh, phenyl groups are trying to avoid one another now rotating so that they are not um, sterically hindered. So there I made triphenylphosphine with only half a dozen clicks, even though it's an atom with um, 20 or so, 30 or so um, atoms in it. You can in fact add entire molecules. If we go to the top left here and just create a new molecule, um, if I go to the add fragment button, and rather than selecting functional group, I select molecules. There are many molecules from which I can choose. Um, and uh, some of these uh, will be quite useful to people who are, for example, biochemists um, and who don't want to go to the trouble of drawing the same uh, sugar time after time. For example, uh, we could go to cyclic sugars and open up cyclic sugars and uh, look for the one that I particularly like, which is alpha d fucoparanoise pyranose, uh, which looks like that. I select that, I come to the middle of the screen, and with a single click, I've managed to uh, put that sugar onto the screen, and I could, in principle, then set up a QCAM calculation for that sugar and send it off, but I might not be interested in the sugar itself. I might want to do some alchemy first, Perhaps I want to convert one of the hydrogens um, into a chlorine atom with a bit of alchemy or something like that. Um, so by starting with these built-in fragments or entire molecules, it can be very easy to make large and quite complicated um, systems. All right, the next topic I'd like to look at is how you optimize structures uh, using IQMOL. So we'd like to find some equilibrium structures. And I'm going to use uh, this as an excuse for um, also doing a calculation of an isomerization energy. So I would like to find the difference in energy between the cis and trans isomers of difluoroethene. 
the molecule that we looked at before. So let me very quickly and without much commentary recreate um, cis difluoroethene. So I add the hydrogens and then do a bit of alchemy and just relax the energy of that using the force field calculation. There's my cis difluoroethene. I'm going to symmetrize that. Um, and down here you see point group C2V in the bottom left hand corner. So I now have a nicely symmetric C2V um, cis isomer. And I'm going to set up a QCAM calculation at a slightly higher level of theory this time. I'm going to use Hartree Fock 631G star. The star means that I put D functions onto the heavy atoms in this molecule, the carbons and the chlorine, uh, fluorines uh, in this molecule. And rather than just calculating the energy, I'm going to calculate the geometry. Uh, calculate geometry means that I'm asking IQMOL to ask QCHEM to optimize the structure. So play with the carbon-carbon bond length, the carbon-fluorine bond length, the carbon-hydrogen bond length, and the various angles to make the energy of this molecule as low as possible. That's optimizing the structure. So I'll submit this calculation. I'm going to call this cis-opt because it's the cis isomer and I'm optimizing its structure. Um, this will take a little bit longer than before because the job is now being sent off to California again. This time it's being told to play with the geometry, the structure of this molecule until its energy reaches a minimum. And that takes more calculation time on the part of QCHEM. Also remember we added D functions, which will also slow down the calculations. But notwithstanding all those, the result has already come back. Do I want to copy the results back from California? Yes, I do. So I'll bring those back. I'm going to put those into a new folder called sysopt. So I'll bring those back and I get my gold star over here, which is good. I open up the um, sysopt menu. And the, if we go to the very bottom where it says geometries, if I open up geometries, I see a sequence of numbers here, which are the energies that QCAM calculated for the molecule, starting with the structure that I originally gave it, minus 275-719055. But then as it optimized the structure, as it figured out optimal bond lengths and bond angles, you can see the energy dropped a little bit, became a little bit more negative and finished up at minus 275.5. 721306. These are in atomic units. The atomic unit of energy is equivalent to about 2625 kilojoules per mole. So I would have to multiply that number by 2625 to convert this into the total energy in kilojoules per mole. I'm not going to do that right now because I'm interested in the other isomer. So I click on new molecule and this time I'm going to create the trans isomer. So I go back to carbon, create carbon carbon double bond, add some hydrogens, do some alchemy, but this time we're going to convert that hydrogen to a fluorine and that hydrogen to a fluorine. Use the force field to make the geometry a bit more um, appropriate and symmetrize the molecule. This time the point group is C2H. Um, because that is the point group to which the trans isomer belongs. I will go again to set up QCHEM, and uh, fortunately IQMOL has some memory, and it's remembered that the last job I wanted to do was a hartree fock 631G star optimization of the geometry. That's all set up there already, so I don't need to change anything. Everything's ready to go. The charge of the molecule is zero. The multiplicity, it's a singlet, so I don't need to change any of these things. I'm just ready to submit this calculation. I'll call this one transopt and send that off to California to be calculated. So what's going to happen is that um, QCAM will optimize the structure of this molecule. This will have a different energy from the cis isomer, maybe higher, maybe lower. Perhaps you have a prediction as to whether it will be higher or lower. 
And when uh, all the bond angles and bond lengths are optimized, the result comes back from California. And I copy the results back into a new folder called transopt. Uh, these things are accumulating on my desktop, so I can look at them later if I so wish. So I bring those transopt results back, open up that menu uh, to see what the trans isomer looks like, optimized. Open up geometries to see the energies. And what do we learn from this? Well, we see that as before, QCAM managed to lower the energy a bit by tweaking the geometry of this molecule just a little. And finally, the trans isomer has the energy minus 275.721738 atomic units. And we can compare this number, the trans energy, with this number, the cis energy, and we can see that the trans isomer is a very small amount lower. These are negative numbers, so it's a larger negative number. So it's a bit lower in energy than the cis isomer. If you do the conversion into kilojoules per mole, it's about one kilojoule per mole, or about a quarter of a kilocalorie per mole. So at this level of theory, hartree fock 631 G star, the cis and trans isomers are almost isoenergetic, almost exactly the same energy, which is perhaps surprising, unless you know about something called the cis effect, in which case you may be less surprised. Let me show you another example. I'm going to close up uh, my cis and trans isomers here and do yet another molecule. This time I'm going to do ethene because I'd like to find, not ethene, sorry, ethane. Done enough ethene. So I'm going to do ethane. That's carbon carbon single bond. I add some hydrogens. Now, IQMOL is smart enough to know that uh, when it adds the hydrogens, it should add them in a way that the two methyl groups end up staggered rather than eclipsed. And uh, so it has done that. And if I just manipulate this, you can see that uh, this, this molecule is staggered. Um, if I just symmetrize it, it belongs to the D3D point group, I can go off and do a calculation of this uh, to find uh, the energy of staggered ethene. Um, I'm not going to do this because we're, we're short of time and because I've already shown you how you would do a calculation of that sort. But suppose I wanted to know the rotational barrier in this molecule. So I'm interested in rotating the methyl group, or rotating the carbon-carbon single bond. So I'm interested in the difference in energy between this staggered form and the corresponding eclipsed form. How would I do that in IQMOL? Well, I would select, as we did before, uh, some atoms that define a torsion angle. So I'm going to select those two hydrogens and those two carbon atoms. And then I'm going to come here to the build menu where it says set geometric constraint. I'm going to click on that. This is a very useful dialog because here I can configure the torsion. I can say what value I'd like this torsion angle to be. At the moment, it's 60 degrees because the molecule is in the staggered uh, form. But if I and apply that, that rotates the molecule into the eclipse form. So you can now see if I go into manipulate mode, that is now fully eclipsed. I can symmetrize that every H, then I could set up a calculation in QCAM on that D3H structure. And in that way, I could calculate the energies of both the staggered and eclipsed form, and I could take the difference, and I would find that it's around about 12 kilojoules per mole, which is very close to the experimental value. And uh, that's good. Uh, so that uh, also shows you how you can manipulate the structures that IQMOL gives you when you want to use non-standard structures, such as uh, eclipsed methyl groups. The final thing I'd like to illustrate for you is a vibrational frequency calculation. I'm going to start a new calculation on ethanol. So ethanol is a pair of carbon atoms, then an oxygen atom. Add some hydrogens to that. Um, make the structure a bit more reasonable. 
I'm not content with that structure because the hydroxyl, um, the alcoholic hydrogen is not pointing in the right direction. So I'm going to select it and the oxygen carbon carbon torsion. I'm going to select geometric constraint on that and say I'd like those to be in a transoid arrangement. Um, and now that, that pleases me more. That's more like the uh, ethanol molecule I'd like to see. And then I would set up a calculation on this. And here I would need to do a two-phase calculation. First of all, I need to calculate its geometry, so optimize the structure, bond lengths and bond angles. And then I would add a second job. So this is job one, the geometry job. I would add a second job, job two, which would be a frequencies job. And this is a double barrel job. So QCAM will be asked, first of all, to optimize the structure and then to do the frequencies. I could submit this calculation. I'll just call this freak. And that has gone off to do probably the most time consuming calculation uh, from this webinar, the vibrational frequency calculation on the ethanol molecule. So in order to compute this, not only does it need to optimize the structure, as I mentioned before, but it also needs to calculate all the force constants for the stretches and bends and uh, torsions in this molecule. Uh, the results have come back, which is good. I'll put those into a folder called ethanol. Bring those results back from California. And when I open up Freak, you see a, a menu item here, which we haven't had before, which is uh, frequencies. And if I open that, we have a list of the vibrational frequencies that we just calculated then for this molecule, ethanol. Um, which range from a very low frequency mode, 270 wave numbers, up to a very high frequency mode, over 4,000 wave numbers at this level of theory. And if I uh, am interested to know what that low frequency mode looks like, I can double click on it, and you can see that it is essentially the methyl uh, rotation around the carbon-carbon um, bond, uh, which gives rise to a very low frequency um, vibration. If we go up to the 1133 vibration, look at that. That, that uh, looks primarily like a mixture of carbon-carbon stretch and the, um, the bend of the uh, alcoholic OH group. If I double click on the word frequencies, it opens up a, a nice dialogue uh, which shows all of the frequencies in this table, which I can scroll through on the side. Uh, their intensities, infrared intensities, on the right-hand side of the table, and a mock spectrum here, uh, where there's a, a spike drawn for each of the um, vibrational frequencies with an intensity indicated by the height of the spike. I can broaden these by clicking on the word Gaussian or the word Lorentzian. I can play with the width of these in this mock-up of the spectrum. And if, as before, if I double click on one of these frequencies on the left, I can animate uh, the particular mode um, in order to see uh, what is happening in that mode. So I think uh, on that um, dynamic note, I'll draw this uh, webinar to a close and uh, hand over in case there are any questions people would like to ask. Thank you, Peter, for that really thorough and informative webinar. Uh, now we are open for questions, so if you have any, please type them in the question box and I'll pass them along to the speaker. Um, but in the meantime, I've got one for you, Peter. Um, you know, occasionally, I, you might need to, uh, when I use IQMOL, I need to tweak the position of an atom, maybe shift it around a little bit. Um, not just moving the whole molecule as a, as a group. And I believe that some of those features are hidden behind hotkeys, like you hold down a specific key on the keyboard, then click and drag? Are, are you That's right. Here? That's right. So you can uh, manipulate parts of the molecule by selecting those parts that you would like to manipulate. And then uh, if you uh, click and drag, it will affect only the parts that you have selected rather than the entire molecule. This is, as you say, a slightly more advanced feature. And uh, possibly Andrew, Andrew Gilbert, who's going to give the next webinar, uh, will illustrate that. 
um, in some of the systems that uh, he will be uh, talking about in his webinar. But yes, you can do that. So you don't just have to manipulate the entire molecule as a whole. Thank you. Would it be possible to show how to initiate a transition state search using IQMO? Yes, so I, I actually um, wondered about including this in the webinar and decided not to in the end uh, through lack of time. But mm -hmm. um, one of the examples that I show uh, to my undergraduates is the isomerization between hydrogen cyanide and hydrogen isocyanide. So for example, if I wanted to investigate that, I could draw a carbon atom and uh, a nitrogen atom. And uh, let's perhaps make a triple bond between those. And then in hydrogen cyanide, the hydrogen is over here to the left of the carbon. And the hydrogen isocyanide, it's over here to the right of the nitrogen. So you might guess that the transition structure uh, for the interconversion of those two isomers uh, would look like uh, something where a hydrogen atom might sit perhaps something like in that position there. So it's in transit uh, part way from the left-hand side over towards the right-hand side. So one could draw a structure like that. Uh, one could, perhaps one would need to uh, make sure that the carbon nitrogen triple bond was a sensible length, uh, which you can do in the way that I showed you before with the set geometric constraint, um, just to, so it starts off sensible. Um, I put my hydrogen here at 90 degrees. You might like to make it uh, a more acute angle or a more obtuse angle. Um, doesn't matter too much as long as it's in the right kind of neighborhood. And then I would come up here to a calculation and do a QCAM setup. And rather than calculating an energy or a geometry or a frequencies, those are the ones that we've looked at so far, you would calculate a transition state. So you would select transition state, all other aspects of the input are the same. And that transition state calculation, I won't submit it here, but if I, I did the dialog box would disappear. That transition state would be given this guessed structure, this right angle, this bent looking molecule as its starting point. And QCAM would then hunt on the potential energy surface for a saddle point on the surface, not for a minimum as we've hunted for before in this webinar, but for a saddle point, which would correspond to a transition state. And it would indeed find one which um, actually has a structure rather similar to the one that I've drawn here. I know this because I've done the calculation previously. Uh, and then you copy that back from California as before and have a look at its energy. And if you compared the energy of the transition state with the energy, say, of hydrogen cyanide and took the difference, that would give you the predicted barrier height for this reaction, the amount of energy that you need to inject into hydrogen cyanide to get up to this rather unhappy transition state so that it can then fall down the other side to form hydrogen isocyanide. Great, thank you. I think that answers that very well. I think maybe uh, one more quick one here. Um, yeah, maybe there might not be a direct answer to this question that the uh, viewer is looking for, but uh, how, how does one, is it possible to avoid selecting bonds when one selects atoms in IQMOL? Uh, so when one selects atoms in the way that I did by uh, clicking on the select and then by clicking directly on the atom, then you have selected an atom. If I just turn that off and select the nitrogen by clicking on it, that's selected the atom, turn that off. I can come to the middle and select the bond. They look quite different. So these things are independently selectable. And there are some things, again, these are slightly more advanced features where I might want to select a bond because I might want to stipulate something about that bond. For example, that it mustn't change its length during an optimization. I might want to constrain a certain bond length between two atoms in a molecule to a 1.5 angstroms throughout while optimizing the rest of the um, molecule. Uh, sometimes that, that sort of constrained optimization is useful to do, and you can achieve that by uh, selecting the bond. So if your selection process goes awry and you've accidentally selected things that you didn't want to select, um, you can use 
um, command Z, which is the undo under edit. You see the undo functionality here is command Z. Um, that will undo things and take you back. Or if you want to take away all your selecting, then uh, for me, that's command shift A that turns off all the selections. And then I can select exactly what I want, whether they are atoms or bonds or um, sets of atoms, up to four of them, if I want, say, a torsion. Did that uh, address your, your question? Uh, yes, absolutely. And uh, I actually did not know about this functionality myself. Thank you. Um, I think that's about all the time we have. Uh, I would like to thank the speaker. Thank you, Peter, for a really educational webinar. Uh, I know that um, I'm sure everybody that was here today is going to get a lot out of it. And when it's posted on YouTube, um, it, it's also going to be extremely useful. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. Um, feel free to contact me if there are more questions. And uh, remember that we have a very responsive support email address. You can find it on our website here. Uh, you can also like QCAM on Facebook. Uh, you can view this webinar in a couple of days and all the previous ones on our website. You can find them uh, right here, the workshops webinars section. These are all the webinars we've ever given and they're on, on YouTube. Also useful for many of us are uh, instructional materials. These can be used for teaching classes using QCAM. Uh, really useful stuff. Uh, I'd like to thank Peter one more time and all the attendees one more time for an excellent webinar. This concludes our webinar. We would like to thank Professor Peter Gill for his excellent presentation, as well as Dr. Adrian Morrison for organizing, running, and moderating this webinar. We also invite you to visit us on Facebook. Thank you for your participation and see you at the next webinar.